Uh, it gives me great pleasure this evening to introduce Robin. Um, I'm, I'm actually Sue Smith and I'm the membership chairman for the Civic Trust, if anybody doesn't know that already. Um, and uh, I'd also like to introduce you to Gareth Jane, who is the, also a trustee and is hosting the meeting this evening in charge of all the technology. So if it goes wrong, it's Gareth's fault anyway. Um, I say it's really, I'm very pleased to um, introduce our speaker this evening, who's Robin Burton. And some of you may know Robin as Christine's husband, because Robin's wife, Chris, is one of our tour guides. But this evening, he's here on his own account, and uh, he's a, a published author. He's, he, he's built his own house, I think, I read on your, your profile. It says a house builder anyway. Um, <laughs> chairman of the Stroud Wassail, and apparently that is the most fun you can have with your clothes on. Is that right? Uh, most fun you can have with your clothes on and without leaving the country. That's right. Okay. <laughs> okay. Without leaving the country. I believe you're also the publicity trustee for Glostrad. And this was originally a heritage lottery uh, project, which was born out of a wish to make the traditional songs and music collected in the county more accessible for schools and choirs and the folk scene and researchers. And Robin, you told me um, recently that uh, at the beginning there were just 12 people involved with this work, but now there are over 400. And many no, of those... No, no that's not, not quite it. For the, for the Stroud Wassail, we started about five or six years ago with 12 people in the museum. Ah. Uh, this year we had about 400 performers. Wow, that is amazing. I've written it down too quickly and got muddled up between the two things. You do so many different things. <laughs> but I did also look you up on LinkedIn, which is what I do, I'm afraid. And I can see that you're the lead singer in a band called Gloucester Diamonds. Is that still well, right? Actually, not Gloucester <laughs> Diamonds now. I'm with Swing, Swing Rioters. Swing Rioters. You see, you haven't kept your linked up. <laughs> uh, up to date. Anyway, I think this evening we're going to be in for a lovely treat. So... Thank you very much, Robin. Over to you. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Can you all hear me? Yes, all good. Excellent. Good stuff. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, let me start off. Tonight, we're, we're going to be talking about our heritage of song, uh, which I've subtitled The People's Voice. There stands a cottage on yonder moor, a cottage I never have seen before. A fair maid, she lives there, a fair maid, she lives there. It hails, it rains, it snows and it blows. I shall be wet through beneath me clothes. So I pray, love, let me in. I pray, love, let me in. Something uh, started me to think about what it means to be English. We all have so many identities, European, British, English from Gloucestershire. But what precisely does it mean to be English? Well, John Major, bless his cotton socks, was once asked this very question on Radio 4. And his answer wasn't very clear, to be honest. He talked a bit about rainy Sunday afternoons and cricket but beyond that, he didn't really have much of, uh, much of an answer. So where can we look for uh, a feeling of Englishness? Where, where might it come from? Could it come from our ancestry? Well, uh, this picture here is, is the oldest known Briton, which was Cheddar Man, who was discovered um, a few years ago but his DNA had recently been processed. And this is a reconstruction of what we think he looked like. And of course, he came from Africa and was, as you would expect, um, dark skinned. And he was followed over the various centuries by successive uh, waves of immigration, which didn't supplant the people who were already here, but uh, substantially mixed and mingled with them. And we ended up with uh, what we have today. So. If we can look to a racial basis for what it means to be English, probably the best thing we could say is that we're all mongrels. Could we instead look at the royal family? Well, of course, as we all know, up until 1917, this was the house of Saxe-Coburg, 
which doesn't seem to have a very English ring to it, um, probably has more in common with other royal families throughout Europe than it does with the average person in England. How about English culture? And by that, I mean culture with a capital C. Um, thinking of things such as portraits of the National Gallery, Shakespeare, and so on. And whilst I think this, this certainly does have something to say for some people within England, it, it probably is not uh, something that is shared by all of the population, certainly not uh, the working class population. So I asked this question as to whether English folk song and dance might actually be one of the best places to look for a sense of Englishness. So that's what tonight's talk is all about. So folk song. Many people think of folk song as being something that's a bit twee and a bit ineffectual and maybe not to be taken terribly seriously. But that's not true everywhere. Take a look at this. This is a picture of a folk song concert and uh, it's packed. I don't know if any of you know where this is. Uh, the flags are flying on the left hand side there, which might give you a bit of a clue. But this is uh, in Estonia. This is Tallinn. And every year they have a folk festival and it's absolutely packed. They have giant screens outside. So for those people who couldn't get inside can still see and follow what is going on. And the people of Estonia, they believe that they owe their very freedom to the power of folk song. Uh, they held what was called the singing revolution and acquired freedom from the Soviet Union. If you look at some other countries, for example, famously Ireland, in Ireland, they they've have a strong identity tied up with uh, folk song and music and dance. In fact, such a strong identity that the uh, Irish Tourist Board has uh, seized on it and makes a great deal out of it. And they've done very well right, of marketing um, Irish folk song and dance, which is interesting considering that actually in England, we probably have a much broader and richer um, collection of uh, folk song and dance than they do in Ireland, purely by virtue of the fact that we're you know, a, a much larger country with, with many more people living here. If you go to Scotland, of course, um, they're very proud of, of their tunes and their traditions and kilts and bagpipes and all that kind of thing. And here you can see uh, Earlston, which is a town in Berwickshire on the, in the southern in the uh, Scottish uh, borderlands. And here it says, welcome to Earlston, home of Thomas the Rhymer. Well, Thomas the Rhymer is actually a folk song. It goes, uh, harp and carp, come along with me, Thomas the Rhymer. And wouldn't it be nice if we actually had a sign going into Gloucester that said, Gloucester, home of Tom Brilla's oven. Well, maybe one day. Now, Kazuo Isaguru is a uh, Japanese gentleman who at the age of six came to live in England, which is where he spent um, his life. And he's probably best known for being the author of The Remains of the Day, which was uh, considered to be a great study of the English um, culture, in English uh, manners and behavior. And um, Kazuo once, said that the English have an enormous treasure chest that they just have not gotten round to opening yet. And by that, he meant our tradition of song and dance. And um, he said that most English people, for most English people, their own culture is more exotic for them than perhaps the, the culture of Africa or India, which is an interesting comment. So, it, but it wasn't always so. Around 16, uh, around 1900, uh, Flora Thompson, who wrote uh, Lark Rise to, to Candleford, said that the loudest sound that you could hear in the British countryside or the English countryside 
was the sound of people singing. We'd sing on our way to work, we'd sing while we were at work, we'd sing on the way home, and we, in the evening we'd sing in the pub. So it was part of our very nature. You know, we, we all sang, no matter what we sounded like, we all took part. Then something changed. And this something changed us from being participants in the culture, in other words, actively being involved, singing, dancing, etc., to being largely an audience. And that something was the radio and uh, the gramophone. So all of a sudden, rather than uh, using our own, uh, our own imperfect voices, we could turn a switch and hear somebody who had been professionally trained sing a song for us or play us a tune. And suddenly it seems we got a bit embarrassed about uh, doing these things ourselves and maybe a bit embarrassed of the material that we were singing and we stopped. But not entirely. Within us, the singing spirit still lives on. And I think it's clear to see this from the number of community choirs that are around today. But in, for most people, it, it's very occasion based. So for me, there in the top right hand corner, it's every time I take a shower, which is a great place to sing because the echoes and, and, and the sound quality is brilliant. And usually most other people in the house are far enough away not to hear you. Or well, we also sing at birthdays. We all sing happy birthday. Um, we'll sing at football matches or rugby matches. And when I was a young lad, we actually used to sing on the bus when we were coming home from a coach trip away somewhere. So I think the spirit of singing is still with us. But unfortunately, a lot of the songs that we used to sing have been forgotten. And Nearly all of them would have been forgotten if it wasn't for one thing. And that one thing was something that started to emerge at the end of the 19th century. And it was the belief among classical music composers that their music should have a national character. And the debate went round as to where could this national character be found? And in the end, uh, they concluded that the best place to look was in the folk songs and music of the common working people. And so, starting in Germany, uh, composers started to go out and note down the songs and tunes that were used um, in these folk songs. But um, England uh, joined in fairly soon, um, probably the best known person for this was uh, Ralph Vaughan Williams, who in his, um, uh, his work, the Fantasia on Green Sleeves, included a number of English folk songs, including this one. A fine young man it was indeed, was mounted on his milk white steed. He rode, he, he rode himself all alone until he came to lovely Joan. But Ralph, or Rafe, wasn't the only one. There were many others. Alfred Williams, George Butterworth. In Gloucester, uh, many people know of Peter Kennedy, who used to have a house near the park, and Roy Palmer and Lucy Broadwood, and also locally, more recently, people like William Davis. But tonight, I'd like to talk about four particular individuals, mainly because I find their stories interesting and quite a bit romantic as well. The first one is this gentleman, Cecil Sharp. Now, Cecil Sharp is, is quite well known in the folk world. And in fact, the uh, headquarters of English Folk Dance and Song Society is at Cecil Sharp House. And Cecil was a musicologist and like most um, musicians at the time, he was actually 
fascinated by German music. That was the fashionable thing around about the turn of the century. Um, and he went on a trip down to Somerset to a village called Hambridge and uh, to stay with his friend who was the, the vicar at the local vicarage there. And um, one day they were sat outside in the garden taking tea when the story goes that from the garden next door, they could hear the sound of someone singing. And it was this gentleman. He was rather appropriately called John England. And he was a gardener. And the song that he was singing was the seeds of love. And I don't want to uh, surprise anybody, but the, the seeds of love is not actually about gardening. It's about something else. But anyway, um, Cecil was so entranced by this song because it was like nothing he'd ever heard before. Um, English folk music was completely different in structure and, and the use of modes compared with um, classical music. And so he, he immediately went round to talk to John and noted down the song and that evening went into the vicarage and transposed it so that they could play it on the piano and and so on and the next day he went around the rest of hambridge asking other people if they knew any songs and he went from there to traveling throughout somerset and then throughout gloucestershire as well in search of songs and tunes eventually he realized that a lot of songs had already been lost from the mainstream, even the mainstream working class community. And so he started to, uh, to look in some of the people who were on the fringes of society. Uh, so people like gypsies, where he found quite a, a wealth of songs and also Americans. So he went on an expedition to America, to the Appalachians with his friend Mar Mar uh, Maud Carpeles. And they went around the various homesteads playing what was called the front, uh, the front porch game, where they would sit on people's front porches and the neighbors would be invited around to perform for them, to uh, sing songs for them and to do their dances. And so he captured these songs and then re-imported them back to England. So it's, it's, it's a lovely thought, I think, to think that there were these songs which had been lost back here in, in Mother England and uh, they were saved and brought back from America. So that's Cecil. Next, uh, we have an absolutely fascinating personality, uh, Sabine, Sabine Bering Gold, who most famously wrote Onward Christian Soldiers. That's how most people know of him. But he was a very, very accomplished author. He had more than a thousand titles in the British Library. And rather strangely, one of those was the Book of Werewolves, which was for a long time um, considered to be the, uh, the definitive tome on that, uh, on that subject. And the rumor is that he was asked to do a, a book on uh, vampires as well, but he didn't actually get around to doing that. As you can see, he was a clergyman. Um, he, he had an awful lot of children, but he was also a travel uh, writer. He went to Iceland um, a long time before anybody else ever thought of going to Iceland for holiday, uh, traveled around it and uh, wrote um, some memoirs uh, in, in a, tra you know, a travel book, basically. But we know from uh, reading his travel book and from some accounts of people who were doing the same thing at about the same time that uh, Sabin was a little bit prone to, shall we say, exaggeration and not letting the truth get in the way of a good story. So he also um, used to resurrect or, or sorry, restore uh, stone monuments, things like stone circles and so on. So he's an interesting character. And one night, uh, I should say his, his parish was on the edge of Dartmoor. And one night he was having dinner with some of the other local gentry. And the subject of 
and a local folk song came up and they asked each other what songs did they know and uh, it turned out that everybody knew uh, you know Tom Pierce Tom Pierce lend me your gray mare but apart from that they didn't know anything very much so Sabin said that uh, he'd go away and before they met again he'd go and collect some more songs for them to hear so off he went <clears throat> and he started by talking to some of the uh, local gentry again but he quickly found that nobody else in the local gentry knew any songs either so he discovered that he had to go and talk to the local working people which was uh, quite a step for a member of the of the gentry in those days and um, what he would do he would send out his man with a coach and horses uh, to anywhere that, where he heard a report of a, a good singer and bring that singer back to the, um, to the vicarage. And he would sit him down in this uh, settle here, a tall back settle on one side of the fireplace with a large jug of cider. And then he would sit on the other side of the fireplace and ask the singer to, uh, to begin. And he would sit there and note down the songs. And from that, we get a, a lot of really good songs. Um, some things like, come my lads and let's be jolly, drive away dull melancholy, for to grieve it would be folly while we are together. Which is a crackingly good song. But he, he also um, censored a lot of the material that he collected. As he, he intended to publish and did indeed publish a number of, his, of these songs in collections. And um, he was a little bit shocked by the original material as, as a Victorian uh, clergyman. For example, there's one song which I learned in, in junior school, which is, as I was going to strawberry fair, singing, singing buttercups and roses, which on the face of it, sounds like a very innocent um, song, very su suitable for primary school children to, uh, to learn and to sing. But when you read his original notebook, it's very clear that the original song that he heard and noted down was all about selling sex at the fair. But nonetheless, thanks to Sabin Bearing Gold, uh, we have quite a collection of really good songs that we otherwise might have lost. Next is Percy Granger. So he's probably best known for English country gardens, you know. Which is actually originally a Cotswold Morris tune. And if you if you if you play the tune with a bit more swagger, you can see that that's the case. Now, Percy was an Australian pianist and, and composer, and he came to, uh, to, to Britain armed with one of the newfangled dictaphones. And uh, he was very fortunate to be invited to a house party by Lady Elcho out at Stanway. Now, Lady Elcho's parties were the parties to get invited to um, around that time. And um, at this particular party in 1908, there was the former, former Prime Minister, the former Colonial Secretary, John Singer Sargent, who was the go-to man for having your portrait painted at that time. And in fact, you can see there a portrait of Lady Elcho and some of her friends that was in fact uh, painted by John Singer Sargent, and also Percy Granger and his girlfriend, Karen Houghton. And during the course of this house party, uh, Lady Elcho suggested that it would be a spiffingly good idea if they all went off to the local workhouse and persuaded the inmates to perform for them. And that's what they did. And uh, today, you can see some of the results of that um, in the, on the Glastro website, um, <laughs> and uh, it's very interesting. As you can see, Lady Elcho and the inmates probably found an awful lot in common. 
between themselves. Finally, James Madison Carpenter. Now, he was an American and he was an anthropologist. anthropologist. Now, when I think of anthropologists, I tend to think of people who are going to the South Sea Islands and studying the strange doings of the, of the, of the natives. Well, this is what he did in the Cotswolds. He, he was here for about seven years altogether on and off. Uh, and he took round with him this you know, newfangled technology, the dictaphone. And um, he recorded an awful lot of songs and dances. And one of the songs we'll, we'll talk, out, talk about a little bit later. So that was James Madison Carpenter. So what about the songs themselves? <clears throat> well, all life is here, really. There are songs about heroes, tragedies, humor, love and lust, although more lust than love, to be honest, drinking, customs, and work. Now, not many political songs, which might sound a little strange to people because uh, when you think of modern folk songs from of the 60s and, and 70s, you very often think of them as being political songs. But we think that politics very, has a very short shelf life and uh, future generations are not really interested in the politics of previous generations. And so there may well have been songs, but they were simply forgotten. Um, they weren't handed on and they fell into, into disuse and, and weren't used. And we find a lot of storytelling songs. It was a great medium for storytelling. That's, this probably comes back from the, the time of the bard in the, in the Lord's Hall. And as a consequence, you get a lot of variations in tune and beat within a song, just like you, you have um, dramatic pauses uh, within an actor's delivery of prose. And this is one of the defining uh, things of English folk song is, is this sort of variation, uh, as opposed to, for example, Irish folk songs, where instead you get uh, the use of, a, uh, of grace notes, which I think of as being twiddly extra notes that are put into the song, but not necessarily related to the tune. And these songs are all subject to what we might call evolution. In other words, a, a song Somebody writes a song one day, um, then hands it on to the next person, who hands it on to the next one and the next one. And it branches out, changing all the, all the time as it goes and heading in more and more different directions. And the forces which cause these variations are, are, are several. One is simple loss of memory. In other words, the singer can't quite remember what word it is that goes at, in a particular place. So substitutes it with a word of his own. You know, I do that quite a lot. Then there's the arc of distortion effect. Um, you've probably heard of uh, uh, the old saying when a, a runner within the army was given a message to take, which said send reinforcements were going to advance. And by the time it had made its way all the way back through the various lines to headquarters, it said send three and fourpence were going to advance. Well, that sort of thing happens with folk songs as well. Um, but in folk songs, we, we have an actual name for it, which we call a mondegreen. And this goes from a, a particular folk song, which had the lines, they slew Sir Robert and laid him on the green. And people instead heard it as, they slew Sir Robert and Lady Mondegreen. So that's a mondegreen. And uh, in modern folk songs, my favourite uh, Mondegreen is from The Police, who sang, sang Sue Lawley. Or at least that's what I think they saw, what they sang. But you also get variation because people need to adapt the metre of a song to any musicians that want to be uh, performing with it. Because you have these variations in the natural singing of the song, when you set it to music, you have to, to change things a bit. There are changes to cope with dialect. For example, a, a song which starts off from Gloucestershire might be completely incomprehensible to someone from London. 
Then there's the substitution of favorite phrases. People really did have, you know, particular snippets of song that they particularly liked, and therefore they imported them in to other songs, and, um, and, and that got passed on. And also to fit the audience. For example, we, we talked about um, Whittacom Fair, Tom Pierce, Tom Pierce. In Gloucestershire, we have Stowe Fair, with a different cast of characters who presumably at the time meant, uh, meant something to the people who would be listening and indeed singing the song. So here's an example <coughs> of the song and its evolution and its changing. This is a song which was originally written by a Thomas Lanfier in Watch It in Somerset in 1680. And this particular song was originally called The Good Fellow's Consideration or The Bad Husband's Amendment. Now, not too many people amongst you, I imagine, will have heard of that song today. But after 300 years or so of this evolutionary process that we've been talking about, this folk process, as some call it, we ended up with The Wild Rover. I've been a wild rover for many the year. I spent all my money on whiskey and beer. And uh, called by many the number one Irish song of all time. So this Somerset folk song starts off in one place and travels all over the world and particularly to Ireland and gets adopted. For many years, by the way, this particular song was taken up by the Temperance Society as being, uh, you know, uh, as having a moral tale to advise people about the evil effects of the demon drink. There are other songs which people think of Irish, but actually have other beginnings. The Black Velvet Band, for example, in a quiet little town called Belfast, I thought her the queen of the land and all that. Uh, but, and this original, um, as we can see this uh, broadsheet here, uh, printed by Cliffs in Cyrochester, the original town in, in the song, or at least in this particular version of the song that was handed out, was Barking uh, uh, rather than Belfast. Danny Boy, which to many people is, is the quintessential Irish song, was actually written uh, by a lawyer from Avonmouth when he was on holiday in Bath. And Sweet Molly Malone, who wheels her wheelbarrow through streets wide and narrow, was actually written by a guy called James Yorkston, who lived at the time in Edinburgh. So um, there's one of the other one other thing which affects not so much the evolution of the song, but tends to, to cause them to fall into disuse and perhaps to be um, uh, to be discontinued and not handed on, and that is cultural censorship. Um, cultural filters, you know, the, the, these are these change with time, um, significantly change with time. And whilst, uh, you know, in Victoria times, we, we, we heard about how Sabin Bering Gold was very concerned, uh, you know, about the original material, so he changed it so that it wouldn't offend his audience. Um, so these days, we, we also have problems with things like um, domestic violence, songs about domestic violence, or about whaling, or about fox hunting. Um, these songs tend to be quite difficult to, uh, to sing because you're likely to be censored if you do, or censured if you do. Rather. In fact, I found myself singing a song which uh, the next verse I realized was going to be one that uh, might offend some people. So I, I had to issue a, uh, a warning beforehand before I actually got to that verse. So um, now I'd like to just talk a little bit about the single Gloucester project or what is now called Glostrad, uh, W www.glostrad.com, which is something we started a few years ago and um, I've been part of since. And the aim of uh, Glostrad was to produce a website. And on that website, we've collected together as many songs and dance tunes from Gloucestershire as we could find. And these were found from various museums, from various collectors uh, and uh, in other places. And on this website, we've provided a map. Uh, so you can, go, if you can go to your own particular locality, click on one of these flags, 
and you can see which songs were collected from your locality. It also shows you who collected them, uh, who sang them, and in each case, we give you uh, the original song as collected, <clears throat> but also a version that's uh, prepared for performance. So we, we put it into a key, which is easier to sing. Uh, where some of the verses were missing, we've added verses from other versions from other parts of, of the country or indeed other parts of the world. Uh, we provided a, an audio file so you can hear the tune if you can't read music. And where we have uh, recordings of performances of these tunes, we've put those in as well. This is a project which was done with a uh, Heritage Lottery grant. And as part of the project, we, we were also tasked with uh, doing as much as we could to reach out to the community uh, and to uh, introduce them to the folk song. So we, we did a number of things. One of those was to take some of the children's songs, which had originally been collected at the turn of the century from schools in uh, Winchcombe, and take them back and teach them to the school children there today. And we also got some sixth formers to, to do some videos um, based upon some of the songs. Uh, we did a number of workshops for community choirs. In fact, some of the songs that are on the website are arranged in multi-part harmony for community choirs to sing. Um, and there are something like 1500 songs and tunes on there altogether. And one of the things which we, which we actually uh, looked at was the custom of uh, wassailing. This is because we found 17 songs uh, in Gloucestershire, which were wassail songs. Now, wassail is sort of loosely associated with Christmas or the Christmas period anyway. And when we think of the modern Christmas, we think of um, Christmas as being something where you stay at home, it's a family occasion, it's your family and close friends that come around and see you. It's a special time for children, you know, Christmas trees, um, and Santa Claus. And Santa Claus, incidentally, was originally described in detail by a cartoonist called Thomas Nast back in 1870. So he's, he's not perhaps as, as old as you might think. Uh, and he really became popular when Coca-Cola started using him extensively in advertising in the uh, early years of the 20th century. And we have carol singers and mistletoe. Mistletoe originally came in in the late 18th century, which was uh, a uh, custom amongst the, the servants below stairs. And it, when it became noticed by the people who were living above stairs, uh, it started to become uh, fashionable and popular to kiss people under the mistletoe. <clears throat> but Christmas, and one might say the traditional Christmas, was not like this. The traditional Christmas, was not focused around the family sitting at home. Quite the contrary. The traditional Christmas was very community orientated. It was about getting out together with your neighbors and your friends in large parties. Um, you would bring greenery indoors. You'd have Father Christmas, which is this rather splendid looking chap on the left, as you can see clad in green, um, who wasn't particularly interested in children, quite honestly. He was more of a, you know, a woodland spirit who was very interested in, in drink and having a good time. And Christmas was associated with the suspension of social order. So what we might call topsy turvydom. So the servant would be ser served by the master um, and everybody around the table would have their social status, if you like, suspended for the duration of Christmas everyone would be seen equal, at least for this short period. It was loud, very boisterous, enormous quantities of drink would be consumed, enormous quantities of food, and a Lord of Misrule would be appointed, um, who would uh, tell people to do quite outrageous things, which they had to do, maybe dance naked in front of everybody else, or shout out some outrageous uh, thing about their, their personal history and so on and so forth. It was really very anarchic. It actually sounds like an awful lot of fun. Um, and it was often violent, mainly because of the amount of alcohol that was consumed and disagreements over who should be Lord of Misrule 
and whether or not some of his um, pronouncements would be obeyed or not. And the other thing which came from the traditional Christmas is wassailing. And just to give you a feel for what uh, some people thought about Christmas back then, this is a quote from a gentleman called Increase Mather in 1712, a very pious Puritan gentleman, who said the feast of Christ's nativity is spent in mad mirth, long eating, hard drinking, lewd gaming, and rude reveling. So as you can see, he really thought it was a, a great thing. <clears throat> so, wassailing. What was wassailing all about? Well, if you think about Christmas, especially you know, a couple of hundred, few hundred years ago, at Christmas time and, you know, for a few months into the new year, there's not an awful lot for the agricultural poor to do. There's not a lot of work to do in the countryside. There's not a lot of money coming in, not a lot of food. So what people would do would be to go around and visit their wealthier friends and neighbours and wish them was hail, which is originally Anglo-Saxon in origin, and it means be thou whole, be thou healthy, you know, wish them was hail and wish them a you know, good luck and success for a happy new year. And in exchange, they'd be asking for food and drink so that they could have their own, their own celebrations. It usually involves some sort of door play where they were asking the, the owner of the house to behave as bastard and you would have the maid or you know, you'd have a mummy play. There'd be song and dance. And there would be disguise. So people would disguise their appearance. Um, I'm not sure if you can see me at the moment, but I'm wearing a raggy coat. Now, originally, this was part of a, uh, of, of a disguise. And people would also dirty up their faces, maybe with soot, soot and, uh, and so on, uh, soot and grease. So that in the dark at some, outside somebody's house, it would be difficult to see who was there. And the next day, it'd be difficult to sort of identify who'd been outside your house demanding food and drink the night before. And the reason why you might want to do that is because very often, if you didn't get what you wanted, you would refuse to leave. And you can see some echoes of that in, in a modern carol, which is, uh, we wish you a Merry Christmas. But you get to the line of, bring us some figgy pudding, and we won't go unless we get some. Uh, that's probably where that comes from. But if you still didn't, uh, Come up with the with the goods they might indulge in some act of, of vandalism it's known for example that the plow boys would often take a plow around with them and if you didn't give them what they wanted uh, they would drag the plow across your front garden which is probably not something that you really want now there's a lot of variation in wassailing customs around the country there are at least 30 different ident identifiable forms um, it's not always called wassailing in some places it's called souling or guising in parts of Scotland because of the disguise, I imagine. Um, and the, the actual forms that it follows are, are quite different. In some cases, you, you get it melded with uh, the custom of bud blowing. And bud blowing is the idea of going into the fields, blessing the crops and encouraging them to grow in the spring, maybe making a loud noise to wake them up from the winter sleep and so on. And in some cases that's been melded with the idea of wassailing and today in apple wassailing is, is, is what most people think of as, as being wassailing, but not in Gloucestershire. In Gloucestershire it's more, more about cattle as we'll talk about when we get to some of the songs. So uh, a few years ago, uh, five or six years ago, we started the wassail with about 12 people outside the museum. And uh, this year we ended up with about 400 performers. In the lead up to the wassail, we go around the, the pubs where we perform a play and we sing songs and uh, we demand, in this case, money from the, uh, uh, from the assembled populace, which we put into a big bucket and, and which uh, we usually give to the food bank. A lot of things go on on wassail day. We start off with uh, singing and dancing in the streets. We have uh, workshops on singing and dancing and various other things. We have uh, some concerts. Then we have uh, 
the uh, door play outside of the uh, subscription rooms where they, we ask the mayor to let us in and give us beer and cake. We have a procession through the streets. And in the evening, we have something called the revels. And the revels is the closest you can get to these days without breaking the law uh, to the original idea of Christmas. So we have a Lord of Misrule. We also have a King Bean and Queen P. And we have lots of different types of entertainment, um, much of which is participatory. Um, here you see the uh, lady shopkeepers of Stroud doing their thing, which has now become a tradition in itself. They turn up every year and do a can-can dance for us. But you also get plays, storytelling, and uh, dances that everybody takes part in. And here's a few uh, snapshots from uh, recent um, sales. As you can see, it's grown to be quite a, a colourful event. With people coming from all over the place for it. In fact, I've had some people come from France. One person even came from Brazil. So, um, time's ticking on. So let's have a quick look at some of the songs. The first one, which might be particularly of interest to people from Gloucester, is George Riddler's Oven which I'm not going to sing for you, but as you can see from the lyrics, it's definitely Gloucester. The stones that built George Riddler's oven, and they come from Blakeney's choir. And Georgie were a jolly old man, and his yed it growed it above his yard. Uh, this song is traditionally now always sung at every meeting of the Gloucestershire Society when they get together. Then there's the holly and the ivy. This um, particular version comes from Churchdown, which is where I live, and it's possibly a little bit different to the tune that most people know, and goes a little bit more like this. Oh, the holly and the ivy, when they are both full grown, of all the trees that are in the wood, the holly bears the crown. Oh, the running of the deer, the playing of the year, the playing of the merry organ, sweet singing of the choir. And this one from Cranham. I felt very sorry for my Uncle Jim. Somebody threw a tomato at him. Tomatoes don't hurt, he, I said with a grin. He said this and did cause it came in a tin to my loo. Tumalay, oh, the cream of society lived down our way. And here's the Sherdington Wassail, which uh, is from a village near Cheltenham, for those who don't know. And in this, you can actually see uh, what's called the Broad, which is a mock bull, um, because in, in this part of uh, the county, the songs um, were typically about cattle, because most of the people would be cattle farmers. And so they, they have verses in them such as, here's to the ox and to his right horn. God send my master a good crop of corn, a good crop of corn that we might all see. To me I sail in bow, I'll drink unto thee. So that's the Shirting to Wassail. That's available in four part harmony on the Lost Tribe website, by the way. Um, and John Barleycorn. John Barleycorn is a very popular song in, in England. There are many, many, many versions of it, including this one, which was collected by Madison Carpenter from a gentleman in the council houses in evening. And it goes a little bit like this. To me right fall, all all teddy fall, all to me right fall, all I dee. And how they sard John Barleycorn, they sard bitterly. And so on and so forth. And there's this one, There Were Three Crows. Now, this song in particular has a very interesting parentage because it started off, we think, in Elizabethan times uh, as a very sort of courtly ballad, which went a little bit like this. There were three ravens sat on a tree. Down, a down, hey, down, hey, down. They were as black as black might be with a down. And so on. A few hundred years later, and it gets to Gloucestershire, and it becomes a, 
a, a half spoken, half sung uh, song. So were we actually face to face and in the same room together, this is the point where I would be getting you to sing because I would speak the line and then I would expect you to sing it back to me. So I would say something like, there were three crows up in a tree and they were as black as black could be. And I go, all sing. There were three crows sat in a tree and they were as black as black could be. So yeah, Gloucestershire has put its own particular spin on that original song. So please, uh, one thing that I'd like you to do is to have a go. Um, as this gentleman, Martin Carthy, said, the only way to damage a folk song is not to sing it. So don't worry what it sounds like, just get out there and sing it. Trust me, you will enjoy yourselves. We did this back in 2017 in Churchdown Club. We got 80 people in, in one room. We told them it was gonna be a song night and we had 80 people singing along to various choruses. We had a great time, a truly, I guess, traditional uh, historical time. So that's it, ladies and gentlemen. Um, just time for a quick bit of advertising. Uh, I have another talk which is called Tales of Britain in Pictures and Song. If anyone is interested, please ask me. And that's it, apart from to ask you to, if you are interested in donating or volunteering, please go along to the Folk of Gloucester website. I would be delighted to hear from you. So does anybody have any questions? No. I can't see any questions at the moment. Does anybody want to put something on chat or do they want to put their hand up? And if we can, we can ask you to unmute and ask the question. I think everybody's very shy. Yeah, I can't, I, I can't see everybody here. That's the trouble. But ah, Emily has got her hand up. Would you like to unmute yourself, Emily, and ask the question? Yeah, so not necessarily folk, but nursery rhymes. That's always quite a hot topic with Gloucester. And there are various nursery rhymes that are presumably associated with Gloucester, such as Humpty Dumpty. Do you have any information on that? Or is that a completely different topic? I don't have any information on Humpty Dumpty per se. You know, I'm, I'm well aware of, of the, you know, the story associating Humpty Dumpty with Gloucester. And, you know, the belief that it was the siege machine and all, all that. But um, I don't have any information on Humpty Dumpty. Um, but it, it is quite common for nursery rhymes to sort of have this interchangeable relationship with, with folk song. Um, so there's, there's, with the Swing Rioters, there's one particular song where we incorporate a 13th century uh, children's nursery rhyme, which is hark, hark, the dogs do bark when all the rogues are come to town, some in rags and some in jags and some in velvet gown. And, you know, we work that into, into a song, which we call the Thieves Song, which is all you have to come and hear us play if you want to know what that's about. Is there anybody else with a question? Yes, Phil would like to. Do you want to unmute yourself, Phil? Unmute, you need to unmute yourself. That's it, fine, yeah. Um, just saying to, to Robin, he mentioned Increase Mather uh, in your talk. Um, Increase Mather, um, I'm sure it's the same one, was an American clergyman, but he actually spent a lot of time here in Gloucester. At, uh, he preached at St Mary de Lowe Church and also in the cathedral. He came over here to renegotiate some um, some charter, something. But he spent a bit of time in Gloucester. Really, I didn't. I didn't know that. Mm. Um, that's an inter interesting case. I, I actually read about you know the wassailing uh, and, and indeed the Christmas tradition in America, mm. and you know this this whole idea of of uh, suspending the social order for for a period. And even went so far as to, you know, slaves for the period of Christmas were very often, uh, you know, yeah. treated in the same way as their masters. It was, yeah. it really was quite a, you know, a deep, um, a deep tradition, mm. which we yeah. seem to have forgotten. And I, I think the reason it was, it, it, it was forgotten, and the reason why we were, if you like, sold the idea of Christmas being a stay-at-home, you know, close friends and family occasion, was because it was becoming a, a bit violent and a bit dangerous and a bit of a, a social menace, um, especially to the, you know, to the upper classes who could see that the, the working class were, you know, getting possibly a bit out of hand, uh, particularly the wassailers. 
Yeah, yeah, thanks. I'd like to ask you a question, if I may, Robin. Um, yep. John Level was telling me a story about how he was taking you on a tour around the cathedral one day yep. and talking about the American national anthem. And I think the, 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 the music was originally arranged to go with a poem, a drinking poem. A drinking, right? a drinking song, that's right. A drinking yeah. song. A drinking song. And it, this idea that tunes get borrowed for different things is, is very widespread. I mean, you'll see that there's quite a few hymns, for example, uh, have folks tunes is what they're set to, because that is what people would know how to sing. And <clears throat> one of the common things with broadsheets when they were distributed was that very few people could actually read music. So they would send them round and very often it would say to the tune of such and such. You know, to the tune of Cannons Are Blowing or something. Um, and, and that's how it got distributed. So if somebody wrote a hymn, you know, how do you tell people how to sing this? You know, you have to tell them which, which tune it's like, which popular tune it's like. So that's very often what happened. Um, also, with the broadsheets, the broadsheet uh, vendors would teach the people who were going out onto the streets to sell it what the tune was. So they'd stand on the streets and sing the song and then try to sell the sheets uh, containing the song <coughs> for a penny back to uh, uh, back to the people. I've seen there's a couple of questions on chat. I'm just trying to see if I can read them at the moment. Do you want me to read them out, Robin? We've yes. got one from Bubs, and she has asked, when it is safe, will you be holding any more singing sessions in Churchdown or elsewhere? I would love to. I think... Um, I think it would be brilliant if we could do it in, in Gloucester at the Folk Museum, to be honest. I think that would be a great idea if we could one day do that. Um, We're so hoping you will too. <laughs> and it, yeah. there's, there's, there's one as well from um, Sally Campbell. Is wassailing an adult recreation or can children do it? Uh, well, originally it was probably made principally adult because, you know, traditionally, because that's... Um, you know, the nature of it was was begging and occasionally you know, a bit of vandalism and violence might have been involved. So that would have been purely adult. But these days, we, we you'll be pleased to know that we, we've um, tidied up our act a bit and we have made it extremely children friendly. Um, we have a separate wassail, especially for families out at the museum, in the museum in the park, um, where, you know, where we... Uh, we have cake and tea and, and various things like that, especially for children. So it's, um, yeah, children particularly uh, welcome. Uh, one of the things we try and do each year is to have a few sort of workshops and activities specifically for children. So uh, one year we had the make your own raggy coat for the wassail or you know, make your own animal because one of the things we have today with the wassail is a parade of um, fantastical beasts. You know, we have the, the broad, which is the ox on the stick, but we also have Eugenie, who is our giant um, Cotswold sheep. We have uh, various uh, deer and uh, horses, and, yeah, all sorts of animals. Um, so it, it, it really is a very sort of entertaining spectacle for children. And we encourage some children to sort of dress up in their choice of, of uh, costume. Well, I, if, I can't see anybody else with a hand up or with a message. Anybody quickly put your hand up if there's anything else that you'd like to just ask now. Yes, Emily again. Unmute yourself, Emily. Robin, if I need to get in contact with you, how can I do that? Have you not got my email, Emily? No. Oh, right. OK. Um... Emily, I can forward that to you. OK. Brilliant. Done. <laughs> OK, that's brilliant. <laughs> So, from you. <laughs> oh, yes, it looks like um, Jerry wants to ask a question. Hello, Jerry. Hiya, can you hear me? Hello, Jerry. Yes, I Hiya. can. Hiya. How are you, my dear? I'm <laughs> great, thanks. Yeah, it was really interesting. Um, I, I mean, you know, we've we've discussed this uh, between the two of us often, you know, this I, this notion that, you know, other na other countries um, are a lot more protective of the folk tradition than we are. I mean, folk music has all but disappeared from mass media in this country. And um, 
I was wondering whether you might agree with me that it has anything to do with the fact that folk music is about the common people and it comes from below. And in this country, we have this class system where we, we don't think anything worthwhile comes from below. Well, yes. Um, I think historically, up until about 200 years ago, nobody thought anything interesting came from the, the working classes, and it, it basically wasn't recorded. So you know, prior to about 1800, you don't find much is written down about things like Morris dancing, for example, or, no, yeah, or yeah. folk songs, except in, in church records, where you find you know, records of them being paid hey, expenses. Yeah. Drinkers. So, you know, we, we know that those things were going on, but they just weren't recorded and noted down. So, um, is it particular about our country? Well, I think maybe it's because some other countries do have their identity with who they are. It, it, it's much more closely related to their culture. Mm -hmm. and perhaps in Britain, it's because we're still sort of clinging on to this idea of the British Empire and seeing ourselves as, you know, being this, you know, once great, powerful country. But now, of course, we're, we're not that, and we're no longer going to be part of Europe either. So we're this, this little, you know, country on its own. Maybe that will um, spark us into start looking uh, again for our own identity. Um, you know, whether it's because it's not something that's popular with the with the ruling classes well one of the things that is true of course is that historically the ruling classes found many of our folk traditions quite threatening um you know a bit subversive like wassailing i'm sure they they didn't look very kindly on wassailing uh, and certainly didn't look very kindly on the traditional christmas because everybody was having far too much fun and it, it was a bit dangerous to the established you know the established order of things um, and, you know, with some dances, things like clog dancing, you know, today, clog dancing looks relatively twee. It's very often done by groups of young women, you know, and it, it's done in a very controlled way. Whereas the, some of the origins of clog dancing would have been for two, you know, testosterone fueled young men facing up to each other on a street corner yeah. and demonstrating their athleticism to attract the local, the local women. Um, and, and that was was a bit threatening. So I, I think you know, the Victorians generally wanted to try and dress folk music up in evening dress to make it more acceptable mm -hmm. and calm down its, it, it, its wildness, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, but for me personally, one of the things I find attractive about it is, is its sort of its wild nature and its sort of very you know, fundamental earthy, you know, the whole root. Yeah. Root and the fact that you can, you can hear echoes of the past through um, yeah. folk songs, which you don't get in any other way because people didn't write about the common people, as, as, you know, as we've said. Yeah. So the only way you can get any real feel for them is through the echoes that come down through folk song, yeah. I believe. Um, as, now, as the suggestion of what's happening today, that's a good question. I completely agree with you that the media um, pretty much completely ignores our own culture. And by our own culture, I mean you know, the culture of 90% of us, as opposed to the sort of 10% of people who think opera and, you know, so on is, is what it's all about. Yeah. And I think that's a disservice to us. And I think it's something which we ought to try and change. Um, coupled in with that is, I think, this idea of community. Um, you know, we, we, we talked about all this, all of these folk songs were mainly about a sort of community activity, communal activity. Um, and I think we badly need some of that today. We badly need more of it. It's one of the reasons why we started off the, the, the wassail was we wanted to try and do something to try and engage the community and, and get people back together again, to re reignite some community spirit. And I think particularly at the moment, we, the country feels more divided than ever. And I think we really could do with some, you know, some more of this. Um, but that's community singing. So it's, it's not so much about, you know, a performer yeah. on the stage, it's about 
community yeah. singing. Yeah. And, 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 you know, that's what happens in folk clubs and pubs all over the country. And it is virtually ignored um, by the BBC. You know, the BBC this year, since, since, since lockdown, have virtually got rid of all the local folk shows. And those local folk shows acted as a, um, a way of connecting all the folk, or, you know, it, it told people what was happening in their area. But, it, you know, and there's a network of folk clubs. There are more people go to folk clubs before lockdown in this country than went to Wimbledon. Yeah. And yet Wimbledon gets a whole two weeks of primetime TV on the BBC. And yeah. we don't have, I, I don't think there is one single permanent local folk show now on the BBC network. I think they've all gone. I think. Yeah. Well, it's, it, yeah. it, it's not only that, Jerry. I mean, I when I've been into Radio Gloucester, the local radio station, um, you know, I wanted to play a tune, in fact, a song written by somebody we, we both know. And um, I was told that they couldn't do that. Because <laughs> unless unless the song was on their approved list of, of, of songs, which uh, you know, were thought to be popular, I don't know who, who makes the decision about which songs these are but it, it couldn't be played which i think is absolutely crazy because yeah. how on earth are people to get to know about new you know new music absolutely or indeed our, our traditional music it, it's crazy and i for one think that ought to be part of the remit of the bbc yeah because the other thing too which if i could expand on that um, not only then are we not using our folk songs as our sort of national heritage but we don't have a national costume and we don't have a national dance uh, apart from Morris dancing which I don't think a lot of people wouldn't say that was necessarily a, a national dance but we don't have these things like a lot of countries do have a national dance or several national dances and certainly most countries can have a, a national costume but we have nothing we have yeah. no, nothing that's recognizable maybe everybody's going to have to start wearing the same outfit as that you're wearing robin this evening and sort of <laughs> just make it up out of bits and pieces of different colorful things and uh, if we all we could all make one of those i'm sure i would just like to, to to bring this to a close i can't see anybody else with a hand up so i'm going to say thank you that was absolutely fascinating and i'm sure for a lot of us uh, we didn't know very much about this at all and um the fact that you've got 1500 tunes on your website and, and there's 17 wassailing songs alone, you really are enlightening us to things like that. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask everybody if they would like to unmute themselves. So if you can do that now, and I'm going to say thank you very much to Gareth to, for hosting the meeting and making sure the technology works. Thank you. And also if we can just say in the usual way, thank you very much, Robin, absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you. And ha uh, happy Christmas to everybody. So if you all want to happy say Christmas. Happy, Christmas. Happy, Christmas. Happy, Christmas. happy Christmas. Happy Christmas. Happy Christmas. Happy Christmas. Happy Christmas. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you everyone. Bye. Lovely to see you. Bye. You all have a lovely time. Bye. Bye.